for that. Okay, recording in progress. Here we go. Um, again, welcome everybody. If you just came on, I, I see so many names just coming on as we as we speak, and it's very special for me that we can be together like this. There was an article recently, I don't know if any of you saw it in the New York Times, and please feel free to chat in the middle so that we can, I'm putting on my chat right now so that, and thank you, I'm thrilled to be here with you too. I can see you and we can talk in the middle of class, which would be great because I'd love to have your reaction and hear what you have to say. So there was an article in the New York Times recently, and the article spoke about all the different tension engagements that just exploded friction that came up when there were different people coming into stores and items that you normally think should be there are not there. So like I was in Costco today, so many things were missing. I, I couldn't believe it. Just something so simple like hot cups, right? So these store managers and store clerks were saying that in their whole life, they've never seen so much tension, so much meanness, so much out of control behavior as when people come in and they're disappointed and they can't have what they want. Now, of course, many of us are very weary about COVID. Is there going to be school? Is there not school? It wears on us. You know, there's a lot of tension that goes on. Nobody knows what tomorrow brings. But at the same time, if we could think about what is it that we can do during this time to make it purposeful? And purposeful would mean that we take whatever it is that is causing us this angst and this tension and this friction and use it for something good. So you take the challenge and you want to use it to make it into something that has meaning. And meaning would be that I would be that person who would normally blow up at something, or now that we're in this tense, chaotic situation, I'm going to blow up. But tomorrow, after listening to this class, I'm going to be a little bit of a different person. How do I do that? How do I take this time and use it to be an opportunity instead of a downfall? And the way that we can do that is by working on what we call in Judaism, Lashon Kodesh in the holy tongue, Midot. Midot means character. When you study Jewish wisdom, you have to look at the Jewish words because God, Hashem, created this language. So it's not like modern day Hebrew. It's not like English or any other language like French. Lashon Kodesh is the holy tongue. So the word for character in Lashon Kodesh and the holy tongue is called Midot. Midot means measurement, literally to measure, because if you want to measure who you are, the type of person you are, you look at their Midot, you look at their character. With God's help, when you're going to look for a Shidduch, when you're going to look for a match for a child, what do you look at? We always, when my children were looking for Shidduchim, we always asked right away about the Midos, about the Midot, about the character. Because what else counts? At the end of the day, you're left with character when you marry somebody, when you live with somebody. So you have to know about character. And we want to know about our own character. How do I know who I am? I see the way that I behave. I see the way that I act. And if I feel that things are going chaotic and out of control, what can I do with my Mido? Where should I begin? Which character trait should I start with in order to become that better person that I hope to be? Because everything that we're going through right now or any challenge that you go through, it's really that God is knocking on your door and saying, I want to speak to you. Whatever your name is, Hashem says, God says, I'm talking to you now. Are you going to open the door? Are you going to hear what I have to say? Are you going to just keep that door shut and just stay to be the person that you've been all this time? What we want to do is we want to say, God, almighty God, I get it. 
you're talking to us. And we're going to start with Mido. We're going to start with character. So what is the first character trait that we can work on so that we don't become that out of control person? The first character trait for us to work on is called anivas, which means humility. To be a humble person. Why is it so important to work on humility? And how do I know this from the Torah? Why do we start with that? Because when Hashem gave us the Torah, when God gave us the Torah, God gave us the Torah on Mount Sinai, Har Sinai. And you would think there's thunder and there's lightning and all the Jewish people are in one place, okay? The whole world is trembling. There's awe. So what is the mountain? upon which God is going to give the Torah, that Moses is going to climb up to that mountain, actually reach the heavens, study Torah, and then come down and give us the Ten Commandments. That should be like the most awesome, highest mountain in the whole entire world. It should just take your breath away. It should reach the clouds. It should be like when you watch those Netflix documentaries and you have these mountain climbers just going up and your heart is just racing because are they going to make it are they going to fall and they're going higher and higher and they're just a speck which i meant getting the torah here but instead of being one of those huge monumental mountains that takes planning to climb god chose mount sinai har sinai which was the smallest and the lowest of all the mountains. And not only was it so low and small, then you would think, okay, so let God then raise the mountain. Let there be this huge miracle. And let God give us this message that from this little thing comes this huge, huge mountain. And anybody can do that. And anybody can be that. But no, God left Mount Sinai to be this small, little, unassuming mountain. And that was it. Why? Because the message is that each of us must be a Mount Sinai. For the Torah to be given on Sinai, we have to realize that we accept Torah and we become that Torah person. How? When we humble ourselves to become small in a way so that we are able to accept and understand wisdom that's given to us. Why is humility so important in life? And I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about character traits to work on. But humility is the gateway to greatness. And why is that? Humility is the gateway to greatness because a humble person is able to apologize. And a humble person is able to hear. And a humble person is able to learn, able to say, I forgive you. Somebody who's not humble, what's the opposite of humility? The opposite of humility is, is of course, arrogance. An arrogant person can never apologize. Even when they do apologize, it's never a real apology. It's more like, I'm sorry, but. I'm sorry that you're so sensitive. I'm sorry that you had a hard day, that you had to react like that. Just say, I'm sorry. Just say, I'm able to forgive. Not, I'm able to forgive, and you should really appreciate that because somebody else would not forgive what you did. Humility means that I'm able to hear, my heart is open, my ears are open, my eyes are open. There are other people who come before me. It's not all always about me. And especially in the selfie society, where we've said this so many times, where you just hold up your phone and take a picture of yourself. And I don't know if children have any other clue about how to take a picture of something besides themselves. The lens is always on ourselves. Humility teaches me how to put the lens on somebody else how to feel for somebody else. So what really is the key to humility? And who is our role model for us to learn how to work on ourselves and be a humble person? We always say, 
That's what the Rebbitzin always said. My mother always said when she taught, turn the pages, turn the pages, everything's in the Torah. So how do we learn humility from the Torah? Who was that person that we want to go to and learn from? Who was the most humble person who ever lived? And the Torah testifies and says, Vaha'ish Moshe, Moses, Moshe, the man Moshe, Anav Mikol Ha'adam, Al Adama. And Moses was the most humble person who ever lived on earth. And isn't that unbelievably amazing that here you have a person who accomplished more than anybody who ever lived. He actually was able to bring us the Ten Commandments, teach us the Torah, take us out of Egypt. I mean, what more do you want? He brought the 10 plagues. He was the teacher of Israel, the leader of Israel, led us through the desert for 40 years. And I mean, how could such a person remain humble? So my question for us tonight is this, is it possible to be a great person, to be a successful person, to be a known person and still be a humble person? And if that's possible, then how do I plug into that possibility? How do I learn how to be that humble person so that I can be great and achieve greatness and at the same time be of great character? Because if you achieve success and you are an arrogant person, what have you really achieved? Whether you are graduating college with honors and you're in the most amazing college program that there is, and, and you're so proud of that, but if you get graduate that college and you, can, you don't know how to speak to people and you speak with arrogance, then the degree does not impress me. And you can be the most famous doctor in the world, the most famous lawyer in the world, the most successful businessman in the world. But if you don't know how to listen to others and you don't know how to apologize or forgive, then what is your success really all about? Success has to be more than just financial success and fame and fortune. It has to be that you're successful as a human being. I spoke to a woman the other day and she told me that her husband is in one of the most prestigious medical schools in the country right now. But as he is progressing, she sees that he's also refusing to hear what she has to say. And any opinion of hers is just right away like, struck away or anything that anybody says. And she said to me, I don't understand because he's so brilliant. He's so smart. I said to her, I've seen the most brilliant people make the dumbest mistakes in life. Just because you're smart and just because you're successful and just because you're brilliant doesn't mean that you're wise in life. And it starts with character and humility so that you are able to be open hearted to hear and open minded to hear the wisdom of Torah because when you have wisdom of Torah then you know how to live in life so if we're going to go with that then I want to know then how can I be successful and at the same time be humble if I would ask everyone here, and you can chat with me while we're going through, if I would ask you, what do you think the key is? Some responses that I've gotten in life has, has been, so maybe deflect the compliments. Like if people give you compliments, say, no, no, no. Like, I, I, it's not me. I'm not so great. It's okay. There are people who can't accept compliments. Is that the answer? Or is the answer to live extremely simply? and not have anything that's better or greater. So that keeps you very, very humble. Do you eat very, very simply and you never go out and you never do anything that's luxurious? Does that keep you humble? What's the key to being a humble person? In order to understand this, we have to go back into the Torah. And I always love going back into the Torah. If Moshe, if Moses was the most humble person who ever lived, then we have to see how he lived. 
What was the key to his humility before he became Moses, before he became that great leader, before he even brought the plagues, before he even met God? What does the Torah tell us about Moshe? And the Torah gives us a little bit of an intro to Moshe. And the Torah tells us, Vayikdal Hayela, this little boy who was in the basket in the Nile River, he grew up, Vatavoehu Levas Paro, and he was brought by the daughter of Paro, Vayihila Levain, and he became for her a son. Vatikra Shemo Moshe, she called him Moses, Vatomer Pkimin Hamaya Mishisil, because I took you out of the water. Vayihi Bayamim Hahem, and it was in those days, Vayigda Moshe, and Moshe grew, and he went out to his brothers, Vayar Bisiblosim, and he saw them in their suffering. So I don't know if you noticed, but the Torah says that Moses grew. And then the daughter of Pharaoh, her name was Batya, took him into the palace. She became a son to him. Actually, she adopted him, raised him as a prince. And then the Torah tells us, Vayigdal and the boy grew, went out of the palace and saw the suffering of his brothers. So the famous question is, how do you grow twice? The Torah never has an extra word. There's never a mistake. It's never like you're going to go on your Microsoft Word and you're going to see the line underneath that you doubled the word. That's not how the Torah works. Every letter, every dot, every word has purpose. So if the Torah tells us that he grew and then he grew, there has to be a difference in the two ways that he grew. And our sages teach us something amazing. Vayigdal, gadol, to be a gadol. You want to be a gadol? You want to be great? Here's the secret. Before Moses became Moses, the leader of Israel, before Moses became Moses, the prophet, Vayigdal, he grew in height. He grew in years. Here he is in the palace of Pharaoh. Now imagine if this would be you. Imagine if this would be me. And you would be living in the palace of Hitler. Outside of the palace would be the ghetto where the Jews are being taken away and they're rounded up and they're being forced to, into slave labor. They're going into the gases of the ovens. They're going into the crematorias. And you are in the palace in the home of Hitler. You're comfortable. You have your food. Nobody knows that you're a Jew. Would you venture out to see the suffering of your people, what would you do? This is something all of us should really ask because when the Torah gives us these scenarios, it's not just a story. It's something for us to ask ourselves, to put ourselves in this situation. Moses, Moshe could easily have said, look, even if I go out, there's no point. What can I accomplish anyway? Just to go out and see them? Let me stay where I am. But the moment that Moshe left that palace of Pharaoh, the Torah tells us what he did. He felt the pain of his people, and he saw what they were going through. He became great. Now we have a second growing in the life of Moshe. The first, he grew in years. He grew in height. He gained weight. The second time, the second time he grew as a human being, he became what we call Gadol. He became great. The secret to greatness is not that you don't take a compliment, not that you have to live simply, not that you have to put yourself down. That's not the secret to greatness. The Torah is teaching us that the secret to greatness is to be able to get out of, out of your luxury, get out of your palace, get out of your bubble, and be able just to feel for another person, to not be self-absorbed, to not say, as long as it's okay with me. I spoke to someone the other day, and she told me that she would like to work on her davening. She'd like to work on praying better because it's hard for her to pray. And I said to her, think of one person in your life that you know who's going through something. It could be they're waiting to have a baby. They don't have shalom bias. They don't have peace in their home. They're waiting for a shidduch. They're waiting for a match. They're having a hard time financially. 
It could be a mother and child having a difficult time. Somebody who's going through some type of pain. Can you feel for that person? And she said, honestly, I can't. I can't. The moment that you are ready to feel for another person is the moment that you can start working on your midot, on your character. You can find greatness and you could discover what it means to be humble. So to be humble, humility is not about acknowledging. And I, I'm going to say this very clearly. I wrote this out so that we all understand it. Humility is not about acknowledging what I am not. It is about recognizing what I am. It's not about what I am not. Oh, I'm not this and I'm not that. And that's how I'll stay humble. That's not the key to humility. It's about recognizing what I am. So what can I do with the gifts that I have? Everybody listening right now has a gift. I have to ask myself, what is the gift that I have? How can I be great in this world? Sometimes it's just about feeling the pain of another, extending yourself. Moshe, Moses knew this. The moment that he walked out of the palace of Pharaoh, he said, I was given a gift. Now, what can I do with that gift? My next question for us to think about is, how did Moshe, how did Moses know to do this? Who taught him? Remember, he grew up in the home of Pharaoh. The daughter of Pharaoh, the daughter of Pharaoh, her name was Batya. She brought him in from the basket and then brought him into her life. He wasn't raised in his home of Yochevet, his mother, and Amram, his father. How did Moshe know? What was the secret to his success? If you want to know your purpose and mission in this world, I always say, look at your name, study your name. In Lashon Kodesh, in the Holy Tongue, we say shame. And the root of the word neshama, soul, is shame, is your name. What is the name of Moshe and how did that give him the secret to his success? The truth is, when Moshe was born, when Moses was born, his name was not Moshe. His mother, Yocheved, actually called him by the name of Tuvia. Tuvia. And we never use that name. If I would ask you, who was Tuvia in the Chumash? Who was Tuvia in the Bible? Nobody would know. They say, oh, Tuvia. I never heard of a Tuvia in the Torah. Who's Tuvia? Tuvia is Moshe. Tuvia is Moses, believe that or not. So why was his name changed? And why would God, why would Hashem keep Moshe with the name that the daughter of Paro gave instead of his own mother, Yocheved? What is the meaning of his name? Why did he get this name? So I'm going to read it to you from the verse from the Torah. We mentioned it before, but here we go again. And I want us to pay attention because the Torah gives us so many incredible clues for living our life successfully. Okay. Vatere Bas Paro and the daughter of Paro went down the Chotz El Al Hayar to wash in the Nilas in the Nile River. Why did she really go down? She wanted to convert. She wanted to go into a mikvah, we are told. So she wanted to be part of the Jewish people. So she wanted to go down and cleanse herself in the water. And the women who were around her, who helped her, they were walking at the edge of the Nilas, at the edge of the Nile River. And she sees this ark in the middle of the water. And she stretches out her hand and she brings the child in and she opens the basket and she sees the boy. And here is a young man crying. And she feels badly for him. She pities him. And she says, I know that this is a Jewish boy. This one verse gives us such incredible insight to living and why Moshe, why Moses became the person that he was. And the beauty of Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh. 
So Bhati comes down to the river and she sees, first of all, this basket completely out of reach. Why does the Torah tell us this? And she stretched her hand. And our sages teach us that God actually gave her a miraculous strength that she was able to reach beyond herself. You know, when there's sometimes you hear a story of God forbid, like a car that goes on top of a child and somehow there's a father, or there's a mother who can pick up the car. How can you do such a thing? Because if you have that passion and if you have that inner strength that I need to get this done, I will be going beyond myself, beyond any koach, beyond any power that I think I have. And I will do something that I never thought that I could do because I so love this person and I so need to do this. How often in life have you done something that so many people, or you yourself thought, I'll never be able to do this. But here you are and you do it and you get through it and you accomplish something that you never thought that you could ever accomplish. It's like superhuman strength. This is what the daughter of Pharaoh did. She stretched and stretched and stretched. And when Hashem, when God sees that you want to do something so good and you're trying so hard, God's going to actually stretch your hand for you. And she brings that basket to her and she opens it. Then the Torah tells us, but she just gets filled with compassion because there is this, and it says young boy crying inside, but he wasn't a young boy, he was a baby. What does the Torah say he was a young boy? These are the nuances that we pick up when we go into the Torah itself in Lashon Kodesh, in that holy tongue. Why does the Torah say he was a young boy when he was a baby? Because at that moment, do you know what Batya was hearing? Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, was not just hearing the cries, of baby Moshe. Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, was hearing the cries of all the Jewish children throughout the end of time who would be going through suffering, would be going through pain. All the children, all the children in the ghetto, all the children in the land of Israel when those sirens go off and they have to go into shelters. All of our children who are sometimes so afraid from anti-Semitism, from pain throughout the centuries. This is what Batya was hearing and it moved her and it touched her heart. So she then took this boy into the palace and she called him her son. But she said, Ki min because I drew him in from the water and so I'm going to call him Moshe. What does that have to do with Moshe that I drew him into the water? So I drew him into the water. Why should I call the child? I'm drawing him from the water. I drew him from the water. So I call him. I drew him from the water, Moshe. So listen carefully. What is Batya teaching us? What did Batya teach Moshe? Moshe, I'm bringing you now into a palace. You can fly wherever you want. You can go on the most gorgeous private yachts, okay? You can have the most luxurious life ever. But there's something that I dare you. And I dare you never to forget from where you have come. Do you know where you came from? You came from a basket in the river because I dared myself. Don't forget, Batya is the daughter of Pharaoh. It's like being the daughter of Hitler saving a Jewish boy. Do you know what sweat that is? In Judaism, we call this mesiris nefesh. We call this sacrifice. I sacrificed in order to bring you into my life. But I didn't bring you into my life so you should sit in a palace and eat haagen all day. I brought you into my life, into the palace, so that somehow you're going to figure out why it is that God put you into my life, why we connected, what is your purpose, why did God give you this advantage over the rest of your brothers and sisters, why did God bless you with this life of yours, and what are you going to do with it to make this world into a better place? 
If you can do that, if you can figure that out, then you will remain humble. It's not that you don't have gifts. It's that you do have gifts. But what are you going to do with those gifts? You have a purpose. You have meaning. And if you're going to just allow those gifts to be a path to being self-sufficient and thinking that that's the end and the goal of your life to just be happy because you're comfortable, then you've missed the boat. And then you're going to grow into the most arrogant human being. I will not allow you to be arrogant. I didn't sacrifice myself and stretch myself and sweat and put my life in danger so that you forget your mission. From now on, for the rest of your life, your name is Moshe. Never forget it because I drew you out of the water. And the same way that I drew you out of the water, you have an obligation, you have a responsibility, you have a mission that for the rest of your life, if you see somebody drowning in water, whether it be emotionally, spiritually, financially, you have an obligation to make a difference. And now you have to stretch your hand and you have to sweat. And when was the last time you sweat? So never forget it. You have to sweat, Moshe, and sweat for your people. When we have our parenting classes, and many of you, I see your faces on, you've been on from the beginning. You know that we have spoken so many times about children having this ability to feel for another, that we shouldn't be afraid to teach our children to feel for another. I've told you the story when I was a little girl and my parents received a call that one of the members of the congregation, their child was in an accident and needed to heal him, needed psalms said, said for them. And there was company over. My mother sat us down with the book of Psalms and said, pray for this child. So the company who was over, I'll never forget it. She looked at my mother and she said, Rebbitson, really, don't you think it's too much for these children? Soon they're going to cry. I will never forget the way my mother so defiantly without batting an eyelash, with so much strength, she said, some children cry for chocolate, other children cry for licorice. My children, my children will cry for the pain of another. If you have a child in your life, teach that child if you're given a gift, whether it be that you're popular, you're great at sports, you're great at math, what can you do with that gift to make this world into a better place? But that's not just for children. That's for all of us. That's the key to humility. Never forget where you've come from. That there's self-sacrifice involved in living. You have to think. You have to feel. You have to take yourself out of your comfort zone. It's not, oh, I'm not great. It is, yes, yeah, sure, you're great. So what are you going to do with that greatness? And don't you dare, the daughter of Pharaoh said, don't you dare ever be so comfortable that you forget what it means to feel for another person. Knowing this, I'd like us to think about a few ways for us to zero in on humility in our own lives. If we would come out of this Zoom class tonight and we would say, okay, what can I do practically? How can I make this happen in my life? How can I work on my midot? How can I work on my character? Because if Hashem is giving us anything, if God is giving us anything right now, it's an opportunity to really work on ourselves. When this whole new phase of COVID is over, and it'll be over soon with God's help. And we come back to having classes in person. We come back to regular life. How will I be a different person? If I can say that at least I use the time to better myself, then it's purposeful. If I can say that I use the time to better myself and my character, and I became a more humble person, so I'm not one of those who loses it so easily when I don't get what I want. Wow. So what can I do? Number one, be a giver. Be a giver. I can say 
every day either I am great and so I live or I am great and so I give. Which one will it be? I'm great just because I woke up in the morning or I'm great because I'm a giver. Everybody has an opportunity during the day to give. And I don't just mean to give charity. I mean to give of ourselves. When we go to sleep at night, we have to ask ourselves, what did I do today to give to another person? I teach once a week, I give a course in a school called Manhattan High School for Girls. And I challenged the girls, we studied this about humility, and we spoke about Moshe, and we spoke about being a giver. So I said, everyone here has a gift. Imagine that you have a young woman who's sitting here in this classroom, and she's great at something. Let's say you're great at art or creativity. What can you do with that? So a lot of the girls were talking about what to do after they graduate. I said, no, no, no. It's not about after you graduate right here, right now. I gave them an example. I have one of my daughters is really good, thank God, at baking. She's really good at baking and cooking and just, you know, she doesn't even have to follow a recipe. It just happens and it's delicious and yummy. So she heard about a family where the mother does not have capacity right now to make delicious, nutritious dinners for her children. She's, this mother is ill. So once a week, my daughter just drops off a whole delicious, yummy dinner at her doorstep. She doesn't even see her. She doesn't even know who she is. She heard about her. She drops it off. And the children know that that night they're fed. Different women take turns. It's something so beautiful. You could change somebody's life. So we each have to think about what it is that we can do that can make a difference in this world. Because when we say Moda'ani every morning, we say Moda'ani, grateful am I, almighty God, for my life, that you gave me back my soul. The last words we say is, Rabba emunasecha, great is your belief in me. Do you know what that means? It means that God believes in you. God believes in me. If God gives you life, it means you're needed in this world. You weren't born 100 years ago. You were born now. It means that you're needed right now in this world. So we have to figure out, why am I needed over here? What am I needed for? That's number one. I am great, and so I live, or I am great, and so I give. Humility means I realize I have a gift and I know I'm going to give. Number two, know the source of your blessings. That keeps us humble. If, if you have something great, you went on a great vacation just now. You have a beautiful home. You have a beautiful apartment. You got a beautiful piece of jewelry. Uh, you just did your kitchen. Your, your son just got into a great school. You just got into a great school. Something that is great. And somebody will say to you, oh my gosh, you're so lucky. That's amazing. You can either say, thank you. Oh, no, it's okay. It's nothing. Or you could say, thank God. It's either thank you or thank God. And I know that Debbie is listening right now, Debbie August. So I'm going to give her a shout out because from all the years that we have studied together, Debbie coined a phrase called BH, which stands for Baruch Hashem. And when it's really something amazing, it's a big BH. That's something that's so beautiful to say. And I know that it's spread amongst her friends and her kids and her kids' friends and, and a lot of our children, a lot of our children's friends, because the truth is, whatever we have in life, it's a BH. It's a Baruch Hashem. Even if somebody says, how are you feeling today? BH, Baruch Hashem, thank God, however you'd like to say it. But the point is that life is a gift. And it's something for us all to remember and know. Who is the source of this life? Who is the source of every breath? When you have a cup of 
I have a delicious tea right now, right? I'm going to make a bracha. Baruch atah adonai Eloheinu melech olam shakol niyabid varo. Something so delicious like this. What does it mean when you make a blessing? It means I'm saying thank you, Hashem, for this. I don't take it for granted. Even a cup of tea is a blessing, and it keeps me humble. If you're starving and you come into the house, or your kids are starving, they come into the house and you just chow everything down, wolf it down, just eat, and you, you see this delicious piece of cake and you muffin, whatever it is, you're starving, you want supper, and you just sit down and you eat without making a blessing. What does that mean? It means you're not even stopping to think, who's the source of all this? God could have made everything in the world black and white, but God gave us delicious red juicy watermelon and green honeydew and yellow and orange mangoes. And think about it. The world is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. You sit in an ocean and you watch that sunset. Lately, the sunsets, I've been getting pictures from people of sunsets. I don't know, lately sunsets have been gorgeous. It's all types of colors. It's such a gift. If we just stop for a moment and think, who is the source of all this? That keeps us humble. So that's number two. Know the source of your blessings. Number three, watch your tone. Tone is a big key when it comes to humility. An arrogant person will scream. An arrogant person will lose it. Does it mean that whenever you lose it, you're arrogant? No, sometimes we're a little bit spent and we're weary and we had a tough day. But... A humble person will never scream. So how do we work on our tone? Because I'd like this to be practical for us. There's a very beautiful letter called the Igeret HaRamban, which is the letter that the Ramban, Nachmanides, not Maimonides, the Rambam, but Ramban with an N at the end. He wrote a letter to his son who was in Catalonia. And he wrote him a letter that he should read for the rest of his life, at least once a week, in order to keep his teachings alive and to be successful. It's like a last letter filled with wisdom, which is quite emotional if you think about it. If any parent would think to write a last and final letter of the wisdom that you'd like to infuse your child with, this is the letter that Nachmanides gave to his son. And you can look it up. It's called Igeret HaRamban, the letter of the Ramban, the letter of Nachmanides. I want to quote to you something from it. He starts it by saying, Shma b'ni Musa listen, my son, to the discipline of your father, the Alti Tosh Torah but never abandon the Torah of your mother. Tisnaheg tamid ledaber kol devarecha bin achas. I'm asking that you are careful always to get into the mode, into the motion of speaking always benachas. That means gently. Lechal adam, to every person, not just people who are higher than you. Lechal adam, to everybody. Uvechal ace, and all the time, not just when you're in a good mood, but especially when you're not in a good mood, especially when you're stressed. Why? Because with this, you are going to be saved from anger for the rest of your life. Don't be that angry, bitter person. And when you're going to save yourself from anger, what's going to happen? You know what you're suddenly going to find in your heart? the character trait of humility. An angry person cannot be humble. A bitter person cannot be humble. An arrogant person who's screaming at everybody cannot be humble. Your whole life is going to be different if you're able to acquire this trait of humility. The he, this is what he says, the he mida tova miko mido tovot. This character, character trait of humility is the most important and best character trait from all the others. Why? Because once you're humble, you could learn how to 
acquire all the other character traits. But if you're not humble, you're never going to be open to learning and changing. So imagine humility is the gateway to greatness. And then he ends by saying, Read this letter at least once a week, below pachot and not less. Why? So you should be successful in everything that you do. Every day that you're going to read this, every week that you're going to read this, God in the heavens above is going to respond to you. Anything that you ask God for, I'm telling you, he says to his son, you're going to be answered because you're going to be a humbled person. A humble person is one that God loves. When a person is arrogant, God says, you know what? You're so full of yourself. There's no room for me. So you can just be all by yourself and see how you're going to manage. A humble person says, almighty God, I need you. I can't do this without you. And when we work on our tone, we work on becoming that humble person, which brings us to the last, number four. And what's number four? Number four is to pray. Prayer allows us to be humble because it means, as I just said, I need you, almighty God. There should never be a day that we don't pray. Does it mean that you have to pray for hours? No. Does it mean you can only pray in Hebrew? No. You pray in the language that you know. But prayer really is a connection. We want to try to pray in Hebrew, in Lashon Kodesh. Why? Because these are the words that were given to us by our holy sages and the letters and the words of the Aleph Bet and of this holy tongue of Lashon Kodesh comes from God himself. So there's a holiness even in the words. But if I'm not able to understand it and I'm not able to pray in Hebrew, should I not pray? Of course not. Of course you should pray. Because whenever you pray, you create connection. I was speaking to a woman the other day and her son, she said to me, her son said, mommy, I need you to pray for me for a shidduch, for a match. And she said, I don't know how to pray. I said to her, do you ever say, oh God, make this okay? She said, all the time. I said, that's a prayer. Right there, that's a prayer. Why do women not have to go to Minyan? Why do women not have to wake up in the morning and go to synagogue? Why do women not have to stop three times a day, shachris, morning, mincha, afternoon prayer, ma'ariv, evening prayer? Why do we not have to be counted in a minion? Many reasons, but one real big reason is because we are praying the whole day. Women pray the whole day. So you don't need that reminder in the afternoon because the whole day you're saying, oh my God, when he comes home from school, please let him be happy. Please God, let this, let this doctor appointment be okay. At the whole day, the whole day, please let my test be okay. Please let this work out. Please let this apartment work out. Please let this job work out. We're always praying. We're praying for somebody all the time. And most important is that we pray for ourselves. Because sometimes we forget to pray for ourselves. We're so busy praying for everybody else. We don't pray for ourselves. So don't forget that either. So as we come to the end of the class, I want to share with you something that my father, it was my father's yard site this week. I know many of you have received my article that I wrote about him. But it also has to push in this lesson of humility. And I, I want to say it to you, not just to write it to you, but I see your faces. One of the most incredible parenting lessons that I've learned from my father was we were at a wedding, a family wedding, and music was loud, you know, and the kids are here and there. And I have to say, yeah, I was a little overwhelmed. And my child, who was a toddler at the time, was on the floor crying. My father walked over to me and he looked at me and he said, Shefala. He picked up the toddler, scooped him onto his shoulder and he said, Shefala. And he smiled, never be so high that you can't hear the cry of a child. That's called humility. And it's not just about a child. 
It's about anyone in our life. What does that mean? Never be so high. It means that we should never create such a distance from somebody in our life that we love or anybody that we can't hear their cries, that we become immune, that we become indifferent, that we're so far away that it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean I always agree. It doesn't mean that I always understand. But the least we can do is hear. And that is what Moshe taught us. He got out of the palace and he saw the pain of his people. It went into his heart and he never forgot who he was. That becomes our mission in this world. Never should we become so callous, no matter how chaotic or difficult times become, that we can't hear the pain of another. That's the key to humility. If I can work on that and acquire that, then I've come to the gateway of greatness. So here's another just lesson that my father taught me because it should be in the zechus of Harav Mashulam ben Harav Asharanchal, the neshama, the soul should have an aliyah. My father taught me that in order to be considered great, you don't have to be the loudest in the room. Usually the loudest is the emptiest. Here's a tzedakah box. Very loud, but there's very few coins inside. If it was stuffed, it would not make one sound. It's the same with a human being. If I'm very loud, usually there's not so much content and character inside. I don't have to be the loudest in order to be heard. But when I'm filled with wisdom and I speak binachas, I speak gently and softly, that's when people respect us. That's when we're heard. And that means that we are humble and great at the same time. And that's not a contradiction. So I want to wish all of us Bracha, blessing, hatzlacha, success. We should take this time to really ponder and contemplate and think about what it is that Hashem wants from us. How the next time we meet, we can all be a little bit, more, a little bit more humble, but a little bit more great too at the same time. And wouldn't that be incredible to see each other at the same time and say, Baruch Hashem. Big BH, thank God we're here together. I thank you all for coming on. And I love seeing all of you. If anybody wants to chat, thank you. I, I appreciate all of your words that you're giving now. And I really do miss all of you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you all for coming on and taking the time. Thank you all for your gorgeous messages. And yes, a big BH. And I hope to see you all in person.